Great. Well, it's great to be here. I can testify to the incredibly warm hospitality from the Berkman Center <coughs> that completely counteracts the freezing slush and blowing snow <laughs> that one has to navigate to get here. Um, it's been a very warm welcome. Thank you. I'm going to uh, talk to you today about these three things, technology, poverty, and law. It turns out that the intersection of these three is incredibly important right now because of the fact that we're looking to technology um, for almost all of the answers to the big global challenges that we face in the coming decades. Uh, particularly in the space of climate change and poverty, they all have technology components to it. And this, this intersection um, is really an important place to, to get some things right. The problem is that right now that field, uh, that, that uh, nexus is characterized by a sort of sclerosis. Uh, what's going on in that field um, is probably uh, most evident in the intellectual property right field. If, you, if anybody who works on intellectual property right in developing countries knows what I mean by sclerosis <laughs> in this field, um, it's a very polarized field. Um, we're coming up with um, a, to, a, to a place where we really don't have practical innovative solutions. People have sort of dug into the trenches on, on, uh, in positions and they're, uh, they're missing huge opportunities and they're also in some ways operating in the past. Um, a lot of their models that they're using are based on things that um, under our noses in the last 10 years have changed radically. Um, so what I'm going to do today is, is talk about um, the motivation for why we need uh, this Global Access and Action project, which has a very practical bent. Uh, it, it, it's designed to look in the middle space there to say um, with uh, a particular focus on the impact side. You know, if we want to impact poverty uh, with the technologies that we've got available, let's back out what that means for, uh, for the law um, and for the legal tools and for the policy tools. So let's not start with the IP system and work downwards. Let's start with the impact that we want on the ground uh, and try to work backwards to some practical solutions. And you'll hear a lot in the next uh, half an hour or so, 40 minutes, um, about uh, how this is different from what's going on in that field now. Um, it's, a, it's a fairly large departure. So I, I look forward to um, interruptions and challenges and <laughs> questions throughout. Um, and I, I'm totally happy to. Um, to be derailed and uh, go off into rabbit holes. Um, but um, where I'll start is uh, with this photograph. Uh, when I teach at UC Berkeley, uh, I teach a really fun class on the economics and product development of technologies for the poor, and I usually start my lectures with a mystery picture uh, because it tends to sort of pry the students away from their digital devices and <laughs> focus them on the lecture. And I ask, ask them, you know, what's going on in this photo and why is it important to the lecture? So at the risk of insulting your intelligence, <laughs> what's going on in this photo? What is this woman just doing? What's she just finished doing? Voting. Voting, thank you. <laughs> this, uh, it turns out, is um, the Timor-Leste elections in 2012. Uh, she has just voted. And the reason I wanted to start with this photo is uh, because I, I want you to think about the word technology very broadly as we go ahead um, in this talk. Think about all of the ways that technology impacts developing countries. And it turns out that election monitoring and actually the implementation of elections has been um, really importantly changed by mobile phones, by SMS, by georeferencing technology. Um, it started with a sort of... Um, more efficiency brought to the uh, parallel vote uh, counts that they were doing and, and the monitoring. Um, but it's now to the point in the last few elections in, in sub-Saharan Africa where we've got these really interesting systems that are actually in real time coming up with, you know, sort of these sourced information about what's going on in the countries. So that's just a, a, a good example to start with that, that um, the, the impacts of technology are, are hugely diverse and we need to think about them like that. Um, vaccines are often, uh, you know, access to medicines, often where uh, people go when they think about this, this intersection between poverty and technology. They think about agriculture, they think about health, and these are definitely, you know, on the table for this discussion. 
uh, diagnostics, um, essential medicines, all of that. But you should also be thinking about off-grid energy solutions. Huge impact in uh, the poor populations in developing countries and emerging economies. Water. Um, Water is going to be, as we all know, one of the really, really important factors in terms of the next couple of decades. So access to clean water, um, irrigation technologies, we, we have a really important potential here. But you should also think about housing. These kids are from uh, the slums in Calcutta. Um, we have really uh, incredible advances in material science. Whether we translate them and how well we translate them to change uh, the housing conditions for the poor, I think, is, a, is an interesting subject. It turns out that, that um, just replacing the dirt floor in a poor household has a pretty big impact on the health of that household. Food. It's, uh, it's an, an area where I work a lot on. I work um, on, on every side of it, from the nutrition side, um, with supplements uh, like Plumpy Nut. Some of you have heard the sort of miracle suppl nutritional supplement um, through to biofortified crops, through to uh, simply better farming practices uh, and better technologies, better seeds, better fertilizer, better soil diagnostics. You, know, you could go on and on about how uh, you could improve how we can uh, deliver better and, and more food to the poor. And the information and communication technologies. Most people now understand uh, that mobile phones are ubiquitous in developing countries. It's not that they have reached all of the markets. We certainly have a lot more work to do in getting them into really rural markets. Um, but they're a, an incredibly powerful tool when you start combining them um, with some of these other technologies. That, that's going to make a big difference. Um, but mobile phones are not the only piece in, in information communication technologies. I also work on advances in remote sensing, advances in mesh networking, um, uh, advances in wireless sensors. All of these technologies have um, really fascinating impacts on the poverty. And this is just scratching the surface. We haven't even talked about sanitation technologies or technologies that support citizen journalism. or You, can, you could go on and on. So that's just to say that the, the, <laughs> the word technology is very broad, and I'm hoping that, that you know, with the diverse expertise in the room, um, that, uh, that you'll be thinking of, uh, of a lot of these different pieces and not just focusing in on, um, on the health and the agriculture side. And it's a good thing that it's broad, um, because we're going to need it. And this uh, figure on the right is familiar, uh, 9 billion people on the planet by the year 2050. The estimates are that we're going to need 60% more food to feed those people and 20% more water. Um, and that's not even mentioning the, the differences in, in, in the health side of things. So this is, you know, we're really running up against um, very difficult challenges, particularly in our global food system. And we're trying to do it in the midst of climate change. Uh, if you think about the fact that 80% of the food supply for Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa is supplied by smallholder farmers. And many of those smallholder farmers farm on marginal land. They farm on rain-fed land that isn't irrigated. And climate change is going to have a really big impact um, as the climate gets more variable, what they plant, how they plant it, and, and how much they can grow. Um, these 11 countries are considered the uh, top 11 in the next couple decades for disaster-induced poverty. But it's not just in agriculture. If you think about where the storms hit, the increasingly powerful storms, uh, they hit areas where the poor are. If you think about where the sea levels are rising, those are areas where the poor are. So although we tend to have a, a discussion about climate change in, in this country that's, that's very focused on, on Western uh, um, parameters, the fact is that climate change really impacts the poor disproportionately, um, and it's going to make things very difficult for, for our jobs in the coming years. So I get very excited about new technologies um, with an alarming degree of regularity. <laughs> um, I, I like to learn about new technologies, and I like to work on them, um, but I also like to have a sort of reality check on them, because the fact is that it's despite this, you know, uh, incredible wealth of technology that we have, we've really sort of failed to apply them 
to the most basic problems of poverty so far. Um, and that's just to, to sort of bring into the picture here um, that this is not just about the innovation part. It's not just about the cool design that's made in, in the lab. Um, it's, it's about trying to figure out whether that product has value uh, to the community where it's going, try to engage the community into um, expressing whether or not that's something, instead of saying, we think you should be using this, <laughs> bring, back, bring it back uh, into that loop. Um, but it's also about commercialization. Um, a lot of these technologies we have, um, and, and many of the technologies that are sort of bumping around in your minds that you've seen um, either as prototypes or as good examples, if you went back and checked on them, they haven't scaled. They're, they're, they're out there in very, very limited quantities. Um, and I'll talk about a little bit about why that is. Um, but the best place to sort of check your hubris if you're working in international development is Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, this is an incredible continent to be working in right now. Um, just the, the, uh, the innovation, the entrepreneurship that's going on here, it's, it's drastically changed in the last 10 years. Um, but the statistics I'm about to show you uh, illustrate that even with the wealth of technology we have, um, and these are recent statistics, uh, we've really failed um, to make a difference uh, in the poverty there. 80% of the cultivated land in Sub-Saharan Africa is farmed with a hand hoe. So we're talking about the technology of an oxen, or <laughs> um, this is uh, and a, a good reality check for us in terms of, of uh, you know, how, how we're moving forward. 58% of Sub-Saharan Africans don't have access to electricity. 4% of the land is irrigated, 4% of the farmland. Um, even if we just solve the irrigation problem, even if we just, just come up um, and break that into some real numbers, we, we would make a huge difference in poverty. And 330 million, that's I think over a third of Sub-Saharan Africans, don't have access to clean water. So, so that's the reality check to say this is not just about innovating a really cool new technology, um, getting these technologies into products and services um, that the poor will use and getting them uh, manufactured and getting them distributed into these markets is, um, is a really big job um, that we have so far mostly failed. Um, and the law and policy issues here are really at the center of these pieces. Um, so this is the big question. How do we get global innovation and commercialization systems <laughs> to deliver value to the poor? This is very centered around you know, what the poor value, and then it backs out the, the, the fact that it's both innovation and commercialization. And global access and action is um, about the law and policy issues that are involved in trying to figure out how to do this. So what I'm gonna use um, the main part of this talk for is to, um, is to walk through three big trends that I think have really changed what's happening on the ground in innovation and commercialization. Um, and to try to uh, get across why the field right now is so far from providing really good, practical, usable, innovative solutions. Um, because I'm hoping that um, the end of this will have uh, a good conversation and hear um, not only questions, but, um, but good ideas about where global access and action should be heading. Um, this is uh, a new program. It uh, started uh, at the World Economic Forum um, in their Global Agenda Councils, uh, and then uh, come, comes um, just recently to Berkman to find a new home. Um, so we're just in the process of designing it, and it would be great to have uh, you know, collaborative input on, uh, on trying to figure out where this should head. Any questions before I start talking about some of the big trends? Is Paul Pollock involved in any of this? Um, Paul Pollock is a, is a great um, mentor and, and friend, and uh, he certainly is very involved in the evolution of my thinking. Um, so he's, he's, he hasn't been involved in this particular project, but he's, you know, Paul is the one who, you know, as, as I'm sure you know, says, 
if you haven't talked to a hundred farmers, then you know don't even try to think about a solution. <laughs> um, and that's of course what you know part of this is about. You know, you you do need to get out there and look at the very practical side of things. So, so it is a business that has to make money. Exactly. So yes, <clears throat> his ideas have been very, you know, very great in this. What are the major impediments that you feel that you know that are affecting the the effective delivery of uh, <coughs> such technology and uh, commercial systems? Um, I think that question actually is going to come out in uh, yes. the, the answer That's to it may come out. Um, good, good question, but but if it, if I don't cover it, then then pick it back up um, at the end. Um, so these are the three topics that that I think um, have changed so much. The geography of poverty has changed. So we're no longer at a time where uh, poor people live in poor countries um, by their GDP, by their national GDP. Um, the, that model is sort of what we base a lot of our uh, legal and policy analysis on, on the nation state um, model uh, of looking at the poor um, as separated by, by national boundaries. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, the landscape of innovation has also changed. So we need to sort of uh, move past the idea that things are uh, invented uh, and, uh, and the innovators are in developed countries. Um, and all of our language of technology transfer um, and, and, and getting things into the south, um, it's not that that's not a huge source of, of the R&D engine, but we're now looking at a much more complex picture of innovation. Innovation is happening in a lot of different places, um, and particularly for these technologies. And the last one um, is the, the biggest bubble, because I think it's the biggest impact. <laughs> um, the role of companies has changed, and we all know that, that uh, that's been uh, a, a really big shift in that many companies are um, working on social and environmental activities in ways that they haven't been before. So I'll talk a little bit about uh, the drivers there and, and where that um, may afford some opportunities and some new roles for us in the, in the public sector. So um, the geography of poverty. Um, right now, uh, the, this is an uh, Institute of Development Studies, I think, out of the UK, reckons that four-fifths of the population of, under, of those who live on under $2 a day live in middle-income countries. Which is a pretty amazing statement, you know. If you're if you're used to dividing the world by saying, well, you know, you can have the vaccines for these markets, and and you know, here's here's the poor countries, um, and you leave out something like India, um, you're leaving out huge numbers of uh, of of the poor, um, because India is both a commercial market as well as has you know incredible numbers of of. Uh, uh, of people under the poverty line. India will be the most populous country in the world shortly. 76% um, of Indians currently live under $2 a day. So, so that's where we are right now. Um, lots more poverty in emerging markets, lots more poverty in countries where there are this sort of dual you know, commercial markets as well as um, uh, as well as uh, large numbers of poor. There are some people who believe that this is a temporary um, uh, a temporary shift and that if you look ahead to say 2030, we're gonna be back at the point where an estimated two thirds of the population of the poor are gonna be back in fragile states. Um, that's mostly based on whether India can grow, which I would say no, no one knows the answer. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what does this mean for us uh, in this nexus that we're looking at, in this technology, poverty, and law nexus? It means we have to come up with some better models. You know, we, we can no longer um, look at, uh, at the divisions um, and the, the ways that we've done licensing in the past, <laughs> for instance. Um, Terry and I were talking last night about intra-country differential pricing. Now, how do we figure out things like that? Because otherwise, um, we're not going to be able to tackle uh, some of these big problems. I think the other thing it says about our field right now is that we have to figure out how to work with the private sector. Uh, there's a lot more opportunities if the poor are in places um, that have commercial markets that are functioning to be able to work uh, in that way. 
So the second, um, second major trend is that the landscape of innovation is changing. Um, there's a Boston Consulting Group study out this year that says 28% of the top multinationals' revenues come from emerging markets. Um, so, and that's you know pretty well known that that everybody is entering into these markets. What I find, and I work with a lot of companies, is that they're not only entering into the emerging markets, they're entering into low-income markets. Um, you know, almost everywhere uh, that that I work, uh, companies are looking at Sub-Saharan Africa as uh, a commercial market or as a pre-commercial market. Um, so that's one trend that's happening. Uh, a second trend is uh, this incredible growth of emerging market multinationals. Uh, so these are, are homegrown in emerging market economies, um, and, and it's an entirely different trend. Uh, this is not the old school multinationals that we often think of in this field, um, but there's incredible innovation happening there. Um, and the reason why that trend is particularly important for us is because the emerging market multinationals really understand rural markets. They know how to deliver products. They know how to design products and deliver them um, in markets where there are lots of poor people. Um, so it's a really uh, critical piece that we're not, to my mind, we're not really uh, making use of yet. Um, so, and these are not entirely in, uh, you know, in, in the BRIC countries. You know, this is Thailand, Malaysia, South Korea. Um, just as, a, uh, as an exercise, I'm gonna give you a word and you have to tell me what's the first company that comes to mind when you, when you hear the word, okay? <laughs> the word is tractor. All right, how many of you thought John Deere? <laughs> okay, the, the, the largest tractor uh, company in the world is, is Mahindra and Mahindra out of India. Um, so, so just an example that, that in every industry there are emerging market uh, multinationals uh, that, uh, that are not as well known to us uh, you know, in terms of our sort of old understanding of who's producing what. Um, so the, the last trend here I think is, is a little bit slower trend, but, but I think that it's going to have a big impact, and that is um, the tools for distributed innovation and manufacturing. We've all heard about the revolution in manufacturing. Um, you know, whether or not that actually gets translated practically into developing countries uh, and the technologies that I work in, I think remains to be seen. But they're powerful tools. It, you know, if we could actually make some of these work for the kinds of innovations that we need to get out there, um, and these go from you know, innovations in crowdfunding, so new sources of funding for, for these, um, it goes through um, innovations in uh, rapid prototyping, which would be amazing to have, uh, you know, closer local manufacturing. Uh, so, so that's a, a trend that I think is slower, but I also think it's, it's coming. Um, and it would be um, interesting uh, to, uh, and important to, to integrate into this. So again, that question of what does it mean for our field? You know, what, are the, what, are we, what should we be paying attention to? And if innovation is going to tip, um, and is already tipping into emerging market economies and into developing countries. Um, and of course, there's also a tremendous amount of innovation that's very valuable that happens within developing countries and within uh, the communities and the markets that we want to serve, which just hasn't scaled. You know, there's great products out there, there's great ideas, there's great innovations, um, but they don't have the resources to scale. And, and if we can change that, um, what are the things we need to be thinking about? I think. One area is in um, financing. I think we need to figure out, you know, what is the legal and policy framework behind being able to get better financing um, to innovators in uh, developing countries and innovators in emerging market economies. But I think another piece is intellectual property rights. You know, when you have a new innovation, to come up with a strategy for how it's going to be commercialized and how it's going to get out there into a product. Um, so intellectual property rights in the informal economy is something that I think um, we haven't paid enough attention to. Um, so we, we tend to spend a lot of time looking at the formal tools um, and trying to, to, to bring up countries into the formal system. I think we haven't done enough analysis of uh, how things actually work already. Uh, people protect their intellectual assets in lots of ways that don't have to do with the, the formal system. 
um, particularly even things like trademarks, I think, have not really been explored well enough in, uh, in their use in developing countries. They're very powerful tools, much more powerful, I think, than, than we give them credit for. Um, trade secrecy, um, contractual arrangements, there's lots of things that, that that's the way it works there. Uh, so it would be really interesting, I think, to, to understand how to, uh, how to move that forward. So this last uh, topic, this last trend, is the role of companies. Uh, and, and understanding um, sort of what's driving companies to, uh, to work on more social and environmental activities um, is, is a, a semester's worth of lectures, I think, or possibly <laughs> a library of books. Um, but I'm going to try to hit some of the highlights here just to sort of get you thinking about um, what, you know, if you're studying the, 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 the legal aspects, the policy aspects here, you're trying to figure out how you can, at least in, in my world, I'm trying to figure out how I can push companies to do better in these, particularly in the technology and the access to technology field. And so these are the drivers. If, if, if this is what's making them work in these markets, it's making them produce products and deliver them, um, I want to know, you know, how I can lower the risks for them to be there, um, how I can um, uh, make sure that, the, uh, that they're actually delivering something that has value to the poor, uh, and, uh, and how you can uh, create some incentives for them. Um, so, so I think that's an, an, a sort of new field where, where we need to be looking. Um, it's not happening right now. The, the, the public sector, um, largely, it's, it is changing, but um, the public sector in, in this interface between law and technology and poverty um, has been pretty resistant uh, to trying to figure out this, this public-private interface. So uh, go back to socially responsible investing. This dates back to... I think 1921 uh, was the, the pioneer group was the first mutual fund that, that decided to screen out uh, alcohol, tobacco, and gambling investments. So this is a sort of very passive strategy um, where, you know, but, but it's the first one that starts to link, um, at least in my mind, it's one of the first that starts to link um, social and environmental activities with a value to the company. So we're moving from the, the uh, sort of world where corporate social responsibility is a, is a marketing tool. Um, and it's, it, it's mostly, it, it used to be mostly in the marketing department of companies. Um, and we're moving to a place where it's actually integrated uh, into the corporate strategy as adding value in particular ways. Uh, so socially responsible investing was one of the first pieces to move in that direction. Last year, more than 11% of managed assets in the United States could be called socially responsible investments. Um, so the growth has been massive. Um, and then you look at uh, things like integrated reporting. Um, this is a movement to uh, start figuring out, uh, great, you have your sustainability goals, how do you report on them? You know, how can you actually start measuring what a company does? And pulling that sustainability report in from, from sort of the marketing world into the uh, to the mechanics of, of reporting for a company. Most stock exchanges have um, ESG, environmental, social, and governance reporting requirements if you float your company on that. Um, these are, you know, these are interesting pieces that, uh, that but have been used in some ways um, in, in climate change. Um, I think uh, the Dodd-Frank bill had an extractive mining disclosures uh, for, for that field, uh, but they really haven't been used um, to push companies towards more in the access to technology side. Uh, we haven't seen um, sort of an exploration of, of a lot of these drivers. So that's some of what's going on um, on the big corporate side. Um, you know, that's, some of that was about public companies. Um, public companies, I've learned, are, are um, very different to deal with than private companies, which should have been really obvious to me. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it took me a while to figure out uh, that there's uh, an entirely, uh, entirely different set of, of things you can, uh, you can and can't do uh, with a with a public company. Um, but uh, I think that there's there's a lot of um, a lot of really interesting points of law and policy that we could be using there. The second piece I'd like to talk about. Um, is that there's a lot more financing available. There's new sources of financing. This 
in particular refers to the impact investing world. Um, still very small um, compared to the big, um, the, 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 the total um, assets that are out there, um, but it's growing um, and it's an important player uh, and, uh, and, and it's taking on really interesting new, uh, new forms in uh, private equity and venture capital, you know, it's sort of moving out from its, its start in, in, in the foundations and in program related investment. Uh, we need to start figuring out those new sources of uh, financing. And there is, there's a lot going on there, but yeah. Comparisons in um, how much does financial sector liberalization of a particular government's policies with respect to capital controls, um, capital flow outflows, um, insurance markets, secondary offerings, derivatives, and so forth. How much of that matters in terms of the innovation that delivers down to the poor? We certainly know it matters in terms of just the emerging market attractiveness for corporations in general in terms of where they're. But how much of that matters and which of these types of financial sector regulatory policies should we be focusing on if we're I, I, mean, I think that's a great question. We don't know. Okay. Um, you know, they're, they're so, it's, I mean, that's exactly the kind of question that that this nexus should be asking because this stuff is happening um, and we should be trying to figure out. Now, I'm not saying that but somewhere out there someone hasn't answered that and I haven't, and I just haven't read it. Um, but but it's true that we talk about those kinds of questions um, for for a different sector of business, for a different level of business, But but I don't think we brought it down to you know who's actually reaching into these markets with uh, with technologies that make a difference? Yeah. Um, so the financing piece, I think, is is uh, is and and both of those uh, topics that I just talked about are on the the sort of investor and, and finance. And there's a whole host of other reasons why companies are moving into these markets. And and this comes from uh, you know, the, the Porter and Kramer shared value uh, literature. But um, but what's interesting is that these are pieces that I see every uh, every week when I'm working with companies. And those are you know, expanding their markets uh, is the first one, obviously. Um, reaching into to these new markets is, is not cheap, though. Uh, and so trying to figure out access to supply chains is another um, and, and secure those. Um, trying to figure out brand equity uh, to build uh, value in their brand uh, because there's a lot of assumptions that these markets are going to rise in income. Um, and this is particularly true in, in places like rural India, uh, but also, honestly, to, it's true in sub-Saharan Africa um, that there are a lot of places where you wouldn't expect commercial um, uh, expansion, and they're there because of the brand equity issues. They want their brand to be the trusted one uh, when people start coming out of, uh, of poverty into having some more disposable income. Um, there's also an interesting piece, at least in the agriculture sector, where it's become uh, very hard to attract and retain talent. Um, that's one of the constraints to companies right now. And, and operating in these markets uh, ends up actually you know, making your company more attractive. Um, and, and people are happier uh, to stay there. They're happier to come work for you. So that's another. These are all examples of you know, how, how these drivers are actually adding value to companies. On the input supply side, of course, um, companies are, are trying to secure as well as diversify where their inputs come from. You've heard um, you know, lots about this in the news. Uh, in, in, in food, for instance, in, uh, in cocoa, most of the cocoa supply for the world comes from smallholder farmers. So the big cocoa companies in the world uh, that you look at every time you eat one of those chocolate bars, um, they have a huge interest in getting better technology to smallholder cocoa farmers. Um, so, so there's a lot of crossover. Um, we, we're no longer in this, in this um, sort of world where the public sector is operating kind of in parallel to the private sector. And you think about um, the way that we typically or often think about technologies for the poor being invented in a university lab. Um, Amazing new idea! It comes uh, out, and a nonprofit maybe forms in the university or, or spins out, and it and like nonprofit tries to distribute it, tries to get it out there. 
um, that's you know no longer the model, which is good because that has a really hard time scaling. We now have the chance to um, to leverage a lot of innovation and commercialization capacity if we do it right. Um, and and this is where you know a huge number of the the legal and policy issues are. So so there's this sort of crossover now. Um, and it, it has, it's not, of course, as simple that they were operating in parallel before, but um, if you look at the public sector, by the public sector I mean institutions that operate in the public interest. So I include universities because they have a public interest mandate. Um, I include you know, government. I include foundations, aid agencies. Um, if you include the, that sector, um, there's now uh, this sort of crossover where uh, there's a, a big piece, maybe a small piece, but it's a piece, um, where their goals are aligned, um, where the technology that I want to get out, the products that I want to get out to the population that I want to serve um, actually has um, a crossover with having uh, commercial interests. And what's happening is this is changing the role of the public sector. So I want to close with, before I um, ask you some questions to get the discussion started, is just to look at um, how that role of the public sector has changed, uh, because it's another example of, of sort of how far behind this field is. Um, and this is just, you know, just sort of my hypothesis for, for what could be happening on this public-private interface. Um, but I think it's important in part because a lot of the legal and policy tools that we talk about are the public sector responding to market failures, to what we think um, the market has failed and therefore it's our responsibility because we have the social goals, we have the environmental goals, and we need to step in and try to correct it as best we can. Um, and this is true in intellectual property rights. Um, you know, you think about compulsory license, you can think about patent pools. Um, you know, but it's true across the boards. That, that it, and if the role of the public sector is changing, then it fundamentally changes the kinds of legal tools that we need to be thinking about and the policy interventions, interventions that we're thinking about. So there's four pieces to what my admittedly really simple <laughs> analysis is for uh, possible roles for the public sector. Um, the first is to identify where the heck these overlaps are. Um, because if you're spending money working in parallel, trying to do the same thing that a company could be doing, you're wasting money. Um, so to try to figure out where that overlap is, um, because that's sort of much more smart um, spending of resources uh, that are limited. The second piece is to push the boundaries. So the company, of course, operates on those boundaries as to what markets they'll go into, as to what products or what services they'll deliver are based on risks and returns. It's a very simple calculus. Um, if you can change those risks and returns, and, and that's you know, a really interesting place where the, the legal tools come in and where the policies come in, and you can draw them into markets where they wouldn't otherwise be, um, and and uh, and and get them to produce products they wouldn't otherwise be producing. I think there's an an, an interesting, lots of interesting pieces there. Um, the third part is to recognize where these other sources of financing are coming from, and this is you know impact investing, crowdfunding, uh, pay for success bonds. There's just a whole host of things that are out there that are not your typical. Um, financing mechanisms and, and the public sector I think is doing a good job but they need it to do they, they need a lot of help on the legal and the policy uh, side to really understand how to make these things work um, and how to complement those sources of financing and the, the last one is after you've looked at this picture you know where are the pieces that the private sector is never gonna go because there's a lot of those <laughs> There's a, you know, you often hear uh, these sort of evangelists of how the private sector is the answer um, to, uh, to poverty in certain areas, but there will always be populations that are not served and products that are not created uh, by companies because it just doesn't make sense for them. It doesn't make commercial sense. So there will always be a role 
for the public sector in getting better technology to the poor. But if we can target that um, and, and use our resources smartly to understand that, I think that's the important piece. Uh, because at the end of the day, as, as you can tell, I identify as a public sector person <laughs> coming out of universities and, and foundations. And my work isn't driven by, by risks and returns, thankfully. Uh, you know, my work is driven by the needs of, of these ladies um, and whether or not you know, their kids are uh, in better health and uh, whether they have better access to education. Um, whether they don't go to bed hungry at night. Those are the things that, that uh, the public sector and, and that I uh, care about at the end of the day. So that's my summary of uh, these three drivers. And, and hopefully I've painted um, a picture for you of just how far the, uh, the, the real world is from, uh, from some of the models that we see, from some of the work that's going on at this uh, nexus of poverty, technology, uh, and law, and, and how many opportunities there are out there uh, to really uh, get involved in, in very practical ways. Um, I'm going to put up one more slide that has some ideas for a research topics. And these are mostly topics that, that I'm already working on, um, but it would be great to hear um, at some point either today in this room or, or email me um, as you know as we start to to move this project forward at Berkman It'd be really great to, to hear sort of your responses and, and what you think are priorities for um, this kind of uh, targeted uh, project that that we've just talked about uh, so starting in the upper left hand we talked about emerging market multinationals um, so I won't go into that again, but I think there's a lot of really interesting issues given how powerful they are as players and how well they could be serving some of these markets. Intellectual property rights in the informal economy, also something that I'd be um, interested in and, and I'm already starting some work on. Uh, I think there's, there's a lot of interesting questions there. The one at the bottom right we haven't really talked about much um, or at all which is access uh, to data for the poor. Well, this seems to have a pretty high affinity with Berkman. <laughs> um, there's a lot of issues here. Uh, so it's sort of a, 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 a different lecture, I think. Um, one of them that I've worked on, just to give you an example, is genomics data in crop sciences. The, the future of crop sciences is, of course, dependent on uh, genomics uh, and on the bioinformatics tools uh, to process you know, the, the, uh, the data and how that interaction has changed over time between the public and the private sector and, and who owns what and what the partnerships look like is a really important piece of the puzzle because it fundamentally determines whether we can make the advances in the crops that poor people plant or whether this becomes uh, you know, that just the crops uh, that developed countries need get access uh, to that kind of data and those kinds of bioinformatics. Um, and th that sort of question is uh, paralleled in, in many, many um, types uh, of data across uh, the board. And the last one is uh, this idea of looking back at the mechanisms that we typically think about when we think about intellectual property rights and poverty. So these are um, patent pools, clearing houses, uh, compulsory licensing, humanitarian use, reservation of rights, um, all of these tools that we've been talking about for a long time, which hopefully by now you understand that my perspective is a lot of them are actually outdated <laughs> and that we need a lot of new thinking in this place. Um, but what I've started, and you'll see this in the first quarter of, of next year, is a survey of these tools, which doesn't go very deep into you know, the should side of things. But it does at least catalog what these tools are, where they're being used. Um, for instance, you know, and we don't have this anywhere um, in terms of, of the models uh, that we use to get access to technology for the poor. Um, so if you wanted to go someplace and find out, you know, what patent pools are there out there, it turns out that there's only a couple. For all of the time that we spend writing about patent pools, um, the impact of them has been tiny. 
Um, and there's been a lot of expense spent on, uh, ne on negotiating the licenses for them. A lot of time has taken. Um, so, so this is just sort of a perspective to say, you know, here's the set of tools we have, um, and here's kind of that reality check on what's out there, which I think is the first step um, towards kind of rethinking what, what tools we really need to be talking about. So that's the end, um, having bent your ear for almost an hour. Um, it'd be great to hear uh, not only questions, but uh, but also ideas for, um, uh, for like Mark's, where, you know, where, what are the questions that are out there um, that, that we think haven't been looked at yet? Yeah. Is the potential model of intellectual property protection in the formal economy that would differ from the formal economy? Can you say a little bit more about what some of those are that some people are very familiar with? Yeah, so, so, um, you know, the, you you could actually look back to before the patent system started to to you know how how inventors used to protect their their intellectual property rights and and that that difficulty of how do you uh, share an intangible asset without uh, uh, without giving it away um, and, and those still exist I think in uh, in a lot of places in the world where we don't have the rule of law um, up to the standards that that we do in 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 the formal system where the formal systems work um, but I think. A lot of it has to do with trade secrecy, which we haven't really explored. Um, or a, as a as a tool, like just understanding how things function. If you're an innovator, if you come up, if you're in a village or in a small city in a developing country, and you know there's no way, even if you got a patent, that you could enforce it. There's just the institutions aren't there, so it becomes it doesn't have value to you. So what do you do? Um, you build contractual relationships. You use trade secrecy. Um, you invest in your brand. Um, so that you become someone that someone associates, you know, your your company or your name um, with that. So I think those are the kinds of tools. Um, and as I mentioned before, I also think trademarks um, within that picture um, are are a really underexplored tool. Yeah. So 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 the question is, you know, that they're they're much cheaper. Um, you know, are there? Uh, and 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 I think we should do some work on. And maybe it's been done, but I don't think it's 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 out there. Um, how could we make those more accessible? You know, rather than talking about the patent system, which has such a long way to be accessible by the the kinds of innovations, are there other tools that we could you know, make more accessible that would be cheaper? Um, I was wondering if you can elaborate a little bit more on the experience of uh, uh, global access to patents. Uh, is there a recent example that you presented in the, the forum interview on how the other activities are done? And, and I guess my question is also, you know, how, how we can help. Um, so that is in process, uh, in, in discussion. Uh, it's a great question. It's it's um, what I am in town to, to try to start forming. So. Um, the first place to help is just you know, email me with ideas. Um, you know, we, we obviously have a, a, a really broad field that we're looking at, and to get anything done, um, we're going to need to be focused. Um, but, uh, but I think we really want to find you know, what, what the priorities are here at, at Berkman. Um, and so that's the first thing. Um, and the second thing is to watch this space, <laughs> because um, in the next few months, uh, you'll, you'll definitely see um, a strategy for, for moving forward. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Uh, sorry for coming late. Uh, so after I've been here for the past half an hour listening to you, uh, I've been kind of wondering if we've been thinking along the same line. But I should start by thanking uh, um, Jude Bernstein, who I don't even know, who sent me an email two days ago, if uh, I was interested to come here to listen to this, because a year ago I had a similar dream, uh, as you are just, um, as we are just mentioning here about uh, IPR and innovation in Africa. I'm really from Sierra Leone, West Africa, so most of what you said uh, is actually uh, touching mm -hmm. me as if. You knew what I was thinking <laughs> almost a year ago, right? So uh, I actually had to run 
an innovation competition uh, being run by uh, a US-based organization here called Global Minimum. So I had a project in Sierra Leone. And apart from doing that work, I'm also a law student in Sierra Leone, West Africa. And um, whenever we go to radio stations, we go to press conferences, people always say, OK, you run this innovation competition for high school kids to think of ideas, how they could solve uh, their community problems. But have you ever thought of um, how you can think of having these ideas that these kids are coming up with because these are brilliant ideas. They might end up uh, having like uh, something that could be scaled. And uh, is there any protection for these ideas? So I started thinking, so yes, I'm a law student now. By then I was just in my first year in, in law school. So I had to call my the 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 president of my board who happens also to be at the MIT and he is he is too Israelian. How can we help with such uh, with uh, such a thing, right? So I thought secondly that maybe because I since I'm a law student, we don't have the legal framework in Sierra Leone to help this kid because I have to do research, right? So because of the, the numerous uh, calls and complaints that we receive, how can we protect the ideas of these kids after when they come up with this thing? If they are scalable, how can we protect them? So I had to do some research. When I did this research, I found out that we don't have like the legal framework, right? That could encourage, even if we work with this thing for like five years or 10 years into the, into, uh, the competition, there is no like legal policy or framework that this group, this kid or our competition could rely on to encourage more innovations and so, uh, stuff like that. So I talked to my president, uh, the president of the board, and he had to link me with somebody who I've actually not met again, but we had to have like conversation, right? Uh, on email, mostly on email, and who said they would help me to have like a guided research on IPR, uh, intellectual property rights, which was like something I'd always wanted. So I had this um, like a, a framework, uh, a research objective, which is just in line. So when, I, when, when I've been here for the past half an hour listening to you, it's like just in line with, oh, good. with well, what uh, email I have been me. thinking of. Right? <laughs> so something that I can just share with all of you, maybe, on, uh, maybe through email, so that you can see the idea, the idea that I've been thinking of two years ago, is just what you guys are just putting on the table now. Yeah, send it, send it to me and I'll, I'll send it out to, to people who are interested, definitely. Yeah. definitely. Something that I'm Thank you. just so interested in. Great. Yeah. I'm so happy to Love be it. here today. Oh, sorry, you were next. Um, I have a quick question. So the emphasis, the role of companies part, um, your emphasis on socially responsible investing and impact investing sort of suggests that there are enough adaptations of the enough sort of specific tools that the, the gap is really in funding. I'm curious, it, I don't think that's what you mean. But, yeah. Um, so, but impact investing, I think maybe a lot of those investors would say the opportunity set that they're looking at is pretty limited. So then that becomes circular. How do you think around, how do you think about that? And what are some sort of particular examples of um, adaptations that you like? Yeah, so I mean, it's a it's a good clarification because that's not mm -hmm. you know I wasn't suggesting that, um, and I was more introducing it as a um, as one of the places where I think we haven't really used yet in the technology for poverty space that it's been used in more in the environmental and sustainability space um, that uh, that I think it would be interesting to explore. You know what what kinds of incentives um, does that you know what what needs to happen um, if you're going to do this um, and and not so much I think you know the the, the venture capital of course um, you know where it's focused on for instance IPP um, I think that is happening in some ways um, but uh, but there's a different calculus of risk for for financing companies that that are technology uh, you know that are going to produce technology for these markets. Um, so what does that mean for us? You know, it's it's not just about um, looking at uh, at the environmental impacts, which is often you know where where we've seen it. Um, so so I I don't know what the answer is to your question, um, but I I you know mostly wanted to highlight it because I think it is um, it's one of the levers which we're not using right now. Um, even even you know at the level of, of stock exchanges and and you know reporting requirements. Um, 
straight down into you know, impact investors and, and what do they need. Um, so so I, don't, I don't know what the answer is yet, um, but I, I think it's a, it's a field that we just haven't, um, especially when I talk to donors, I think that um, because I talk about the technology side of things, I find that they really don't, uh, they, 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 they understand, uh, of course, the innovative financial mechanism side of things, um, but not so much where it's trying to fund um, this kind of stuff. Could you go one step further and identify a few of the types of new technologies that these new financial mechanisms could be applied to, to like your irrigation example or the, uh, the pest control examples? And some of these that you mentioned um, have not scaled up yet, uh -huh. but if appropriately financed, could be beneficial. That would be um, so, so Terry's referring to the um, uh, to the Sproxo model, which maybe uh, some of you are familiar with. This was uh, developed uh, to look at uh, the counterfeit drug problem primarily in developing countries, and um, it's uh, basically on the packaging of uh, of pharmaceuticals. There's a scratch card um, that's that's embedded in the packaging. Uh, you then use your mobile phone to text in the number. And, um, and it kicks back an answer as to whether or not it's counterfeit. Um, so, so this particular piece was of such interest to the major pharmaceuticals because they do have a lot of counterfeit products um, that, that that didn't have the financing problem. Um, that that actually, um, or at least to my knowledge, um, that, that it was a fairly easy one to launch and, and of course doesn't, doesn't take a lot. There's really interesting applications, however, in taking that out of the pharmaceutical um, and it's been used in, uh, in, in many different areas. It's been used um, to test uh, whether electrical wire is counterfeit or not. It's been used uh, to test uh, whether um, crop chemicals are for, uh, for, for crop protection are, are counterfeit or not. Um, so it's, it's a, it's now that everyone has a mobile phone, it's an interesting model. I'm working on it uh, to try to, to verify um, the adoption of a technology. Um, so right now we don't even know, you know, when a product gets to a low-income household. Um, if you ask a donor, you know, yes, you've funded, uh, you know, this incredible amount of research into this new variety of seed, they can't tell you how many people are growing that crop, um, in uh, of of uh, how many poor people are growing it in their fields. So I think there's a lot um, of possibilities on, on this particular model, um, but I I think. You know, coming up with a uh, the sort of set of, of um, technologies that that meet some of the requirements for scale, some of them don't. Uh, you know, honestly, <laughs> some of the technologies we look at um, in, in in the U.S. that are look really cool um, and and are sort of touted as as having a big impact on poverty um, are unlikely to scale. Um, and uh, but but I think we could do that. Um, and and I think you know that there there are forums where. Uh, you know, connecting the, the investors to those. But I think more importantly, there's probably legal vehicles and legal questions uh, in, in that investment space uh, that would help um, to, to try to start negotiating those deals, to try to understand, um, you know, where we're running up against, which particular types of risk are we running up against? Why aren't they investing in this? Is it just because they don't know the opportunities are out there? Or is it because uh, of other reasons? Yeah. Uh, I'd like to share two points here. Uh, identifying the local technology, as, as you have uh, stated. Uh, there are some experiments going on in India. I hope you must be knowing about uh, Anil Gupta. Mm -hmm. So in uh, Indian Institute of Management, I know he has been doing wonderful work on uh, uh, identifying local innovations and protecting them, uh, making it sustainable for the people and uh, you know work for the poor. There are two initiatives he has come out with. One is the Honeybee Network. Mm -hmm. The other one is Shristi. So the, the major work of this is that, you know, village to village, they go and identify who are innovative and what are the technologies they operate with. And uh, they are trying to, you know, model it and sell it to people. And they also protect it by way of a simple registration type of thing. And they're trying to protect it through policy, uh, you know, initiatives, but that is not happening so far. But at the local level, they're trying to protect uh, the innovators and to replicate to the various uh, you know other communities this is one thing happening 
uh, thousands of innovations. Mm -hmm. It's not one or two. So it's, a catalog, have, yeah. it's a big catalog available. And maybe you know I can share that information to you and others also. The second thing is that when you when you were talking about the leveraging the IP instruments uh, of uh, work for the poor, <coughs> I think it, 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 many people are uh, uh, thinking and uh, you know writing, uh, for example, patents, how it can work for, and copyrights. Uh, there are many uh, uh, initiatives like you know the uh, open access and uh, you know uh, categorizing uh, the IP. Uh, that will work for poor, like you know, Creative Commons initiatives. Because I you know you yourself, as an author, you can uh, open up that you can leave certain part of your uh, copyright. Uh, you know that can be free, that can be shared, that can be you know replicated. I mean, uh, copied or uh, modified, whatever versions, different versions, instead of being too rigid. Okay. One example is in this that the policy is being questioned here in India. Uh, if you anyone knows about the Delhi University copyright case. So now it is going on. Uh, you know, as you said, that 76% of the people in India live less than $2. And it is this huge population, they need education. And India is known for education. They have, they have a you know, strong desire to go to universities and uh, learn you know, uh, uh, the higher education. When they come to these universities, they find it very difficult to get the books and the resources. How can you imagine that these poor people and for example, I'm coming from Delhi University, 80% of people I know that, you know, they don't have any resource to, you know, buy the books. And I, in my whole life, you know, I studied based on the library books. Okay, if I'm here, it is the library books. And most of the people, they st study by taking photocopies. And the universities themselves, they allow certain small photocopy, you know, operators to set up their own units within the university so that they can, so, you know, at the very cheap, only the, the operating cost they will charge and they will make the photocopies and give it to the people and the st students study. And this has been questioned by all the Oxford University Press, Cambridge University Press, every university press stating that the university is conniving with the people, mm -hmm. uh, the photocopiers, and they are infringing the copyright. This is going on and none other than uh, Gopal. Gopal Supramaniam is the, the lawyer who is you know fighting the case now. Yesterday was the argu argument which is going on in Delhi High Court. So this is being questioned. So this is coming out like, you know, right to education versus IP. Mm -hmm. After all, the IP, it is to promote the knowledge of the, the society, as, as well as, you know, the, in the buyback, you know, you also protect the writers, uh, you know, the, the rights, okay? But it should be, it should be uh, flexible, and it should, the, the, the larger interest should not kill the, I mean, the, the, the lesser interest should not kill the larger interest, isn't it? So this is what is being questioned. I think this is happening, and this kind of a discussion should happen. The same thing should happen in uh, patents, okay, and trademarks, okay. I think uh, all the instruments that we have so far developed and which are uh, being operated now, they were uh, designed for different time, different age, different situations. But now we are in a different life. That's the nature of the I law. I think now you know we <laughs> need to rethink about it. Thanks. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I think in some ways that, you know, I understand your framing of the argument. Another framing of it is it's a market segmentation issue. Um, that, that that market segmentation that, that Terry and I were talking about in differential pricing for for uh, drugs actually has, you know, much more uh, broad applications yes, exactly. across a lot of different technologies. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, I want to, first off, uh, I work with a group convened under the International Center for Trade and Sustainable Development that's working in conjunction with the WTO to think about how we should be changing trade rules to better foster both sustainable development and trade. And it's really assuring to hear you reach some of the same conclusions we haven't publicly stated, but we've been discussing internally, which is part of the problem is financing, and there's a much bigger role being played by trade secrets and has been emphasized and so forth. So we should definitely stay in touch yeah, with definitely. all of this. I'd be really interested um, in what you're, you're coming up with. There's yeah. two points and comments that uh, I wanted to make, both in response to the conversation, but also to an issue that we've been grappling with that I wanted to get your input on. Um, one is this issue of access and where some of the problems are and so forth. Um, part of what we've been finding is that a lot of this comes down to distribution networks and that where the web and technologies and mobile technologies allow for circumventions of market failures along the distribution networks, technology has been playing great games, right? But where you still rely upon physical goods to deliver those distribution networks, 
Um, these are oftentimes public sector failures in terms of providing for those distribution networks, mm -hmm. as well as uh, providing for, in some states, right, failed states, security along those networks. Um, that the private sector is not going to choose to enter until those types of public sector failures get cured. And some of these are issues of scale, particularly within Sub-Saharan Africa, in terms of innovation, where we've been looking at, even if you look at the markets and growth that's coming out for the South from the poor, they've been largely coming out from large-scale markets like India, particularly, but also China, Bangladesh, and others to some extent, right, um, that you just don't see the scale here within Africa to be able to deal with. Um, and so this partially comes down to the political configuration of Africa, which we have no ability to redress, right? But that's, uh, I just wanted to point out, I think that's where we're seeing some of these issues and difficulties come into play. Um, the other thing that I wanted to point out is a comment can is I, that- Can I just make one comment yeah. on your though, That just articulating that, though, changes the dialogue. It, it clarifies things, you know, trying to sort of map out um, all of the different pieces that, and some of them you just brought to the table, um, I think shifts the, the, the dialogue away from a sort of black and white access issue um, into the reality, which is which is really complex and changes technology by technology, mm -hmm. country by country. So so I think it's valuable even even if it's not something that we can necessarily do something about right. without a very long national policy process. I still think there's value in. And that sometimes we think about these as capability issues, but really they're historical remnants of colonialism, right? Mm -hmm. That are mm -hmm. affecting certain market dynamics today, right? And that's not something we have the, it's within the bandwidth of tools we can have. But, so the second thing that I wanted to observe was that um, when it comes to technology solutions for the poor, um, we're finding actually that there's a lot of funding, uh, but po potentially more room for funding when you're talking about being able to provide a differentiated product that the quote unquote, I mean, I don't know how many of you here saw Elysium, right? But those who live in the first world Elysium elites, right, we have no desire for, right? So. For example, I think a great success has been um, talking about solar, uh, solar powered basic stoves that don't require, you know, that are using solar powering for stoves that for, for poor markets which aren't necessarily on the grid today, but don't require this gathering of firewood, which saves actually it's really gender positive because it saves women from having to spend so many hours in the field to gather firewood and so forth, right? But that's something that none of us here in the first world ever seeks to purchase, right? This is this is primarily a southern solution for southern problems, right? And so this leads me to I think the observation or the conundrum, the problem that we've been facing is if I can borrow the a marker for a second is in certain goods, like when you talk about textbooks or drugs or even, say, seeds, right? Essentially, from a moral point of view, we aren't saying the South should get an inferior product to the North, right? And then when you look at the cost curves for those or the demand curves, right, they look primarily like this, sometimes with greater shifts out and so forth. But where for the private sector actor, the most efficient point to price is up here, for this because this is where you reap the greatest amount of profits, right? And so for us, I think what's been most difficult for us to grapple with is to how to think about what's the right way to be thinking about IP models to address these types of cost curves. Because the types of IP solutions that are being proposed in academia, patent pools, um, creative commons, and so on and so forth, they don't work in this type of yep. market because yep. the private sector firm has an option of exit. Yep. Right, and That's particularly within, right. yeah. uh, while we have differentiated jurisdictions of markets, right? So as long as they have the option of exit, whatever types of creative solutions we come up with for that doesn't seem to work. And one thing that we have seen work in parts of the developing world is if you're able to shift this cost curve through growth, right, mm -hmm. as we've seen in China or as we've seen in India, actually the pricing drops, right? Because the efficient pricing, these are rational actors, the efficient pricing for where they can reap most profits would be to drop this such that access increases. But it requires a shifting of the cost curve here, right? And that, for us, has seemed that that's why we tie the trade and innovation piece of it, because trade is the part that's actually more responsible for shifting this curve than the IP part of it. But the question that we've been grappling with is, if we're not able to shift this curve because of fail public sector failures in many of these states, right? Is there an IP solution around this, given that what we've thought about today hasn't seemed to work? So that's what we're grappling with. I don't know if you have any additional thoughts or of the processes and so forth, right? Compulsory licensing, patent pools, right? Um, prize funds and so forth, whether anything, right, seems to work better or worse. Our, our sense is prize funds and the like work very well 
when we're talking about southern solutions to southern problems, right? But when we're talking about a non-differentiated good or about, I mean, morally whether or not we want to introduce a differentiated product when there's truly leakages here, right, mm -hmm. that can be had. Um, how we grapple with those types of problems. But I just wanted to share, that's a little bit some of where yeah. I think intellectually we're really grappling and searching for solutions. I'd love to hear any additional thoughts that you have. Well, for better or worse, I think you only have two minutes. The answer is it's a fantastic question, and it's exactly you know where this project is. That, that, that problem is exactly, and there's, of course, five different sides to that problem. Um, that that would require you know, walking through. So so the answer is we should connect offline. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.